Good morning. I'm Dr June Rain and I'm the CEO of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the UK's independent regulator for medicines, vaccines and medical devices. May I first introduce the colleagues who are with me this morning. On my left is Professor Sir Munir Permahamid, Professor of Medicine at Liverpool University and Chair of the CHM's Expert Working Group on COVID-19 Vaccines. That's the Commission on Human Medicines, the government's independent advisory body. And Sir Munir will provide more detail on his work shortly. On my right is Professor Wei Shen Lim, Professor of Respiratory Medicine at Nottingham University and Chair of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, subgroup which has been preparing advice on COVID-19 vaccines. This briefing has been called to announce that the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency has this week recommended to the UK government on the basis of the advice of the Commission on Human Medicines that it should agree to the approval for use of the COVID-19 vaccine developed by Pfizer-BioNTech together with the conditions for its supply and use. The MHRA's recommendation has been reached following an extremely thorough and scientifically rigorous review of all the evidence of safety, of effectiveness and of quality of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The UK government has now accepted this advice and has made the decision to approve the vaccine for use with some conditions in adults aged 16 and over. The safety of the public will always come first. And I emphasize again that this recommendation has only been given by the MHRA following the most rigorous scientific assessment of every piece of data so that it meets the required strict standards of safety, of effectiveness and of quality. We have two or three slides this morning to help our discussion get moving. And in the first one, you can see that unlike the usual clinical trials, which are done one after another, the development of this vaccine has been adapted so that the trials are overlapping and the next one can start before a particular phase has finished. And in this way, we have been able to progress development in the shortest time possible. On the next slide, you can see how the MHRA has worked. And I would like to tell you a little more about this just now. It's been done using a process known as a rolling review. A rolling review can be used to complete the assessment of a promising medicine or a vaccine in a situation where time is of the essence, in the shortest time possible. But, and this is a very important point indeed, that doesn't mean that any corners have been cut, none at all. So looking for the top downwards, the expert working group started in the middle of the year to look at how safety surveillance would be in place to give us the highest possible level of assurance of the safety of the COVID-19 vaccine. And that preparation and planning has been done with meticulous care. Similarly, our National Institute for Biological Standards and Control have been working independently on testing batch by batch the quality of the vaccine. Then in October, the preclinical analysis data became available. That's the third bar down, followed by the interim analysis on the 10th of November. The quality analysis came very shortly after that. And most recently, the batch testing has begun with a final analysis at the very end of the process. So it's very clear that separate teams have been working in parallel to deliver the most rigorous review of this vaccine. No corners have been cut. Our expert scientists and clinicians have worked round the clock, carefully, methodically, 
poring over tables and analyses and graphs on every single piece of data, hundreds over a thousand pages of data and absolutely critically analyzing the preclinical evidence, the clinical trials, the manufacturing and quality controls, and then down to the final sampling. We've also reviewed and agreed the prescribing information so that the public and healthcare professionals are very clear and can be very confident that the vaccine is being used in the correct way, understanding what's involved. And going forward from today, our National Institute for Biological Standards and Control will be independently laboratory testing so that every single vaccine that goes out meets the same high standards of safety and quality. And we've benefited from a further safety step too. Following our thorough review of the data at the MHRA, we have sought the advice of the government's independent body, the Commission on Human Medicines. And I'd now like to turn to Professor Sir Munir to explain the pivotal part its independent members have played in critically assessing every piece of evidence. Munir. Thank you very much, June. So I chaired um, the uh, CHM's expert working group. Uh, and first of all, I'd like to thank the members of the expert working group who worked with me tirelessly with over 40 hours of face-to-face, -face, on Zoom at least, committee work uh, and uh, additional reading time. We made recommendations to the Commission on Human Medicines, uh, which and then undertook an independent review. And the Commission on Human Medicines is chaired by Professor Stuart Rolston. We had a wide variety of experts uh, on both groups, including uh, people who were experts in viral diseases, immunologists, uh, epidemiologists who look at disease patterns, clinical pharmacologists, and uh, toxicologists who are experts uh, in various aspects of medicines. We looked at uh, uh, all sorts of data which is available to us, including raw data, unprecedented access to raw data. Um, and this allowed us to uh, look at the overall risk-benefit analysis. We look at risk-benefit analysis for every compound that comes through in terms of licensing, and we use the same stringent standards to be able to look at the risk-benefit of this particular vaccine. We looked at laboratory data, we looked at uh, um, uh, the manufacturing processes and the quality data, as well as uh, the clinical trial data. From this, we came to the conclusion that there was overwhelming uh, benefit for this particular vaccine and therefore recommended to the MHRA that uh, its use should be authorized. I just want to say a few things about the effic effectiveness of this vaccine. Um, the data show that this vaccine is 95% effective. It is effective in all the groups that were given the vaccine within the trial, uh, irrespective of age, sex, race, or country that they lived in. Uh, we've also looked at the safety of this. The safety of the vaccine is similar to other vaccines, uh, and most of the uh, side effects are very mild and usually last for a day or so. We've been very careful to look at the quality uh, of the vaccine, particularly given the need for uh, storing the vaccine at ultra low temperatures. Um, and we uh, were uh, we had uh, visits from uh, NHS colleagues to tell us what the deployment strategies were and we were able to advise them as well on the uh, stability issues that may be important for uh, deployment. It's important to note that uh, what we have got is data uh, relating to the vaccine uh, up to this point. It is important that we undertake surveillance following uh, the use of vaccines uh, in the population and we were very keen to uh, recommend that the MHRA undertakes uh, active uh, surveillance of the uh, vaccine after it is used. Um, and this includes the use of yellow cards, as well as a special active monitoring program, uh, which we will be inviting people to join. The committee also considered that no specific precautions were required on administration of this vaccine in people who already have had COVID-19 and no testing uh, is required before receiving the vaccine. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Sir Manir. Now I'll turn to Professor Lin 
Wei Shen to tell us about the work of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. Thank you, June. The Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation is an independent scientific advisory body to advise the Secretary of State on the provision of vaccination and immunisation services. As a committee, we've been meeting regularly over the last few months. We've done that to appraise new and emerging scientific evidence related to our role. On the slide, you will see the types of information that we've been assessing. These include data on vaccine safety and efficacy, but also how COVID-19 has impacted the UK. This includes impacts of COVID-19 in care homes, on people from different, different ethnic groups, as well as people in different occupations. The data have come from primary care, from Public Health England, and from hospitals. We've also looked at medical, medical models that have helped us to understand how different vaccine strategies might be used. The UK is fortunate in that we have one of the best immunization programs in the world. Every year, through the infant, childhood, and adult vaccination programs, millions of us are protected from serious disease. All of that expertise also informs JCVI's decision making. For the first phase of the pandemic uh, and its vaccination program, we are suggesting that vaccines are offered in order to protect people who are most at risk of dying from COVID-19, as well as to protect health and social care services, because by doing so, we also protect lives. The advice is divided into two main parts. The first is to offer vaccination according to the estimated risk of dying from COVID-19. The risk of dying from COVID-19 is very strongly associated with age. Age is by far the single most important factor in terms of risk from COVID-19. The second strand to the advice is regarding implementation of the vaccination program. And we advise that due attention is paid locally to mitigating health inequalities. I'll say more of that in a moment. On the next slide, you will see the prioritization order in terms of the offer of vaccination. Residents in care homes for older adults and care home workers are the highest priority. Following that are those 80 years of age and above alongside frontline healthcare and social care workers. Then come those 75 years of age and above, followed by those 70 years of age and above, alongside people who are clinically extremely vulnerable because of specific health conditions. They're followed by people who are aged 65 years and above, and then individuals who are aged 16 to 64 years with underlying health conditions that also put them at risk of COVID-19, but where those conditions are not already represented in the conditions putting somebody at clinically extremely vulnerable risk. The prioritization order then continues down the age groups until all those aged 50 years and above are included. This is phase one of the program. In phase one, we hope that 90 to 99% of people who are at risk of dying from COVID-19 will be included or covered. The next part of the advice relates to implementation of the program. We advise that local NHS providers, local public health teams, and local leaders work together to address community needs and local um, uh, needs. We suggest that community teams work together to mitigate against health inequalities that might occur in relation to ethnicity, deprivation, or access to health care. We also recognize that there may be operational reasons why the prioritization needs to be more flexible. And this may relate to vaccine characteristics or vaccine supply or exceptional personal circumstances. Overall, we have good news today. We have a vaccine that is acceptably safe and effective. Good vaccine uptake will save lives. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Lim. Let's now turn to questions from the media. And our first question comes from Fergus Walsh of the BBC. Oh, right, thanks very much. Um, question for uh, Dr. June Rain. Um, how can, can you reassure the public um, that they can have absolute confidence in this vaccine, given how quickly you've approved it? Um, and for Professor Wei Shen Lin, can you just sum up for me um, the reasoning behind um, your list of priorities about who gets the vaccine first? Thank you. A really important point relates to the thorough work, scientifically rigorous, methodologically sound that the agency has done. And the way of working in a rolling review ensures that our teams of clinicians and scientists are working in parallel to complete all the work according to strict guidelines on safety, effectiveness and quality is complete. This vaccine has only been approved because those strict tests have been done and complied with. And everyone can be absolutely confident that no corners whatsoever have been cut. Perhaps if I could think of an analogy, an analogy, if you're climbing a mountain, you prepare and prepare. We started that in June. By the time the interim results became available on the 10th of November, we were at base camp. And then when we got the final analysis, we were ready for that last sprint that takes us to today. And that is the exemplary nature of the work that's been done. And the public deserve nothing less. I'll hand to Professor Lim now. Thank you. So in relation to the offer of vaccination, Prioritization was based on the risk of dying from COVID-19. And in order to protect the most vulnerable, we have prioritized the most vulnerable individuals first. The other element is protection of the NHS, the health and social care system, because by protecting the NHS, we also protect lives. Thank you. We now turn to Victoria MacDonald from Channel 4. Good morning. Good morning, thank you very much. Can you explain for me why uh, the MHRA has been able to authorise this vaccine so much faster than the European Medicines Agency and the Food and Drug Administration? Is there any difference in the levels of evidence that was submitted or the checks required? And secondly, how long is the lag or is there a lag between being given the vaccine and for it to become effective? Thank you. I'll take the first question and then turn to Samanir. The way in which the MHRA has worked is equivalent to all international standards. We are well aware of our national situation and therefore we have mounted teams, built our capability and worked in parallel. And I want to thank the colleagues who've worked day and night, weekends, to enable us to come to this position. The public can be absolutely confident that the standards we have worked to are equivalent to those around the world. So, Manir. The, the vaccine requires two doses, uh, 21 days apart. And from the data that's been presented to us, uh, you, uh, people will be immune uh, seven days after the second dose. Partial immunity does occur after the first dose, uh, and we can see some protection occurring after day 12 of the first dose, but the best immunity is seven days after the second dose. There will, of course, be longer term follow up to provide further reassurance from the data, the robust data we already have. Our next question comes from Emily Morgan of ITV. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Um, my first question is to you, Dr. Rain. Um, this is a, a pretty historic moment. You've approved this vaccine in record time. I just uh, wondered how much of a momentous moment this is for you and indeed for science. Uh, and then a question to Professor Lim. Um, this is on the priority list. Can you confirm that care home residents will indeed still be the first to receive this vaccine, given how unstable it is and tricky to move? 
to uh, care homes and care home residents, or indeed will NHS staff actually, in fact, be the first to receive it? Thank you. I'll take the first question, if I may. The reason we're here today is the brilliance of science and also the altruism of all those people who have enlisted in clinical trials to give us the tremendously robust data we have today. And thirdly, it's due to the agility, commitment and extremely high scientific standards of all the staff at the MHRA who've worked on this and the privilege of having an expert advisory outreach, our Commission on Human Medicines and its expert group chaired by Sir Manier. So it is the culmination of all these things that the UK is able to bring together and to look always to the public for whom this is for. Professor Lim. Thank you. The JCBI's advice is aimed at maximizing benefit from vaccines and therefore is aimed at the most vulnerable people, which are people in care homes. Whether or not the vaccine itself can be delivered to care homes is obviously an important point, and there will be some flexibility in terms of operational constraints. JCVI's advice is that every effort should be made to supply vaccine and offer vaccinations to care home residents. Whether or not that is actually doable is dependent on deployment and implementation. Thank you. I wonder if Samanir, you would like to add, because clearly while the responsibility of the MHRA relates to the standards of science, we also look at it in the context of the real world, which is what Professor Lim has described. Samanir. Yeah, so we did obviously look at the stability of the vaccine. As you said, it is stored at minus 70 degrees, but uh, we were able to look at stability data and the stability data is showing that it, it is stable for a short period of time at two to eight degrees, which allows it to be transported to the relevant vaccination sites. Thank you. Let's now turn to the next question, which comes from Gordon Rayner of the Daily Telegraph. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I ask, um, have you uh, identified um, when, do you know when the first vaccine will be, um, will be delivered, which day we're gonna, we can expect that? Have you identified the, uh, the first person who's going to get it? And if not, how are you going to decide who that person will be? Um, will the highest risk tiers be given priority? So the, the, the tier three areas with the highest uh, incidence. And also, can I ask uh, whether you know whether economic decisions are being factored in, um, i.e. when you get down the list of priorities, will people who can't work from home uh, get the vaccine before people who can work from home. These are helpful points that everyone wants to know, and I know my colleagues in the Department of Health and Social Care are working again tirelessly to make sure that the first vaccine will be delivered as soon as all the checks are completed. I can speak for the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control, who are ready to complete their checks on the first batch. So everything is being looked at 24-7 to enable this important public health step to be put in place as soon as possible, not a minute wasted. Dr. Lin, would you like to talk a bit more about your perspective on this? Uh, as far as I understand, the NHS is working hard to deliver the vaccines as soon as possible. Um, but that is not within the remit of JCVI to uh, impose any time limits on vaccine delivery. Bear in mind too that many thousands have already had the vaccine as part of clinical trials. So there is a continuum here and our knowledge of benefits increases over time. So perhaps it will seem to be a historic moment when the first person after the approval of supply has their vaccine. But Samanir, we see this very much as a, an ongoing process. Absolutely. So it is very much an ongoing process with regard to this vaccine uh, and, and future vaccines coming through uh, in order to be able to uh, make sure the relevant people in the JCVI list are uh, given the vaccine in the priority order that, uh, that was shown. This is a good point for me to stress that we will be inviting 
members of the public to join us in an active monitoring programme and many will get a letter, it will be by random allocation, inviting them to join this. So please help us to continue to build that body of knowledge about this important vaccine. Could I, just, could I just ask a point about whether the highest risk tiers are the ones which will get it first? Professor Lim? That is the intention of the prioritisation order, is that the most vulnerable people are offered the vaccination first. Thank in you. Tier three. Uh, sorry. In, in tier, tier three? You mean regional tiers? Um, mm. we, we've, uh, our prioritization order is not dependent on which tier somebody is in. It is a national prioritization order. Thank you. That's very clear. Let's turn to the next question. Andy Woodcock from The Independent. Good morning. Good morning. A um, couple of things. We, we appear to be getting uh, authorization for this vaccine ahead of um, our friends in Europe. I was just wondering, does the fact that the, um, the UK is no longer part of the EU, did that make any difference to the speed at which you were able to um, complete your authorization? And secondly, as I understand it, the vaccine which you've, all, which you've authorised, we, we haven't ordered sufficient quantities to cover the whole of the population. I was wondering, do we have enough of this vaccine to get through all of the priority groups which you listed um, earlier on, or would we be dependent on waiting for further vaccines to be authorised in order to get to the position where the whole country can, can um, be safe from this disease? We have been able to authorise the supply of this vaccine using provisions under European law which exist until the 1st of January. So our speed or our progress has been totally dependent on the availability of data in our rolling review and the rigorous assessment and independent advice we have received. So I hope that clarifies the point about the European relationship. Let's turn to Professor Lim around availability. Is there anything you'd like to add on this? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's a very good question about vaccine supply and availability. Uh, the whole reason why a priority listing is required is because we expect during a pandemic that vaccine supply will be limited in the first instance. And so vaccines should be offered in the first instance to the most vulnerable moving down the priority list. We will need as many vaccines as we can get, not just in the UK, but globally. And this includes more than one vaccine type in order to reach all the people who are at risk from COVID-19. So this is the start of a programme and not the end of a programme. And we are absolutely uh, in liaison with colleagues in the Department of Health and Social Care in terms of all the evidence that we have to enable them to do their job to make sure availability is assured. Let's now turn to the next question from Chris Musson of Scottish Sun. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, can I just check, what would your message be, your simple message to people who are sceptical about vaccine safety, particularly in light of some of the anti-vax misinformation that we're seeing spreading on social media? And can I check also, are you, you're obviously going through a similar process with other prospective vaccines. Can you just summarise which ones and what are the timescales, the expected timescales for approval on those other vaccines? Thank you. The public can be absolutely confident that every rigorous check has been done to reach the judgment that we reached, that the benefits far outweigh any risk that the safety of the vaccine has been scrutinised independently by our Commission on Human Medicines and no stone has been left unturned. So absolute confidence in the safety, effectiveness and quality of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. In terms of further products, vaccines for COVID-19 that are coming through, there are two, you'll be aware, for which we have further rolling reviews ongoing and those will be conducted to the absolute scientific standards that the public would expect. So Manir, do you have anything to add on this? Um, no, nothing. 
Let's turn to... Are there any indication on the bank sales there for the other vaccine approvals? It wouldn't be possible to predict today simply that this rigorous process has started in the way that I've described with every package or parcel of data as it's available being scrutinised. And my guess is, Sir Muneer, your expert group is going to be working probably over Christmas to make sure that we complete our work in the shortest possible time. Thank you. Let's turn to Tom Colson from Business Insider. Good morning. Uh, the health secretary has, has said that rolling up a vaccine will be uh, challenging uh, because it needs to be stored at very low temperatures. Um, do you foresee, Professor Lim, potential challenges in offering the Pfizer vaccine to vulnerable groups who might not be able to travel to a vaccination centre or whose GP surgery might not have the cold storage facilities necessary to store the vaccine? Uh, yes, indeed. I think uh, every vaccine that comes through uh, will probably have its own characteristics in terms of storage, transport and deliverability. Uh, so the Pfizer vaccine in particular has a strong requirement for very cold storage and there are stability issues potentially that constrain how a vaccine can be supplied to different people. Uh, let's not forget that a mass vaccination program, as will be uh, conducted very soon is an unprecedented thing. It will be the largest vaccination program in the UK for decades. So there will be all manner of operational flexibilities that will be required during the deployment of the vaccine. It has certainly been a very close scrutiny conducted by the expert working group in terms of the question you have asked, Tom. So, Sir Muneer, would you like to highlight the aspects you have been over. Sure. As part of the assessment of the vaccine, uh, we look at the quality, which includes the stability. And it does need to be stored at low temperature, minus 70 degrees at least. Um, but we know that once it's taken out, uh, it can be stable between 2 to 8 degrees centigrade to allow for deployment uh, in uh, the vaccination sites. Um, and, and that uh, information is being shared with the relevant uh, agencies as NHS, uh, public health uh, bodies, so that they can actually sort out deployment model uh, and make sure that the uh, stability of the vaccine is maintained. It's critically important. Thank you for raising this key issue. Our next question comes from Jasmine Ralston from the Health Service Journal. Good morning. Good morning, thank you. Um, a few from me. The vaccine has been approved by their MHRA with conditions. What are they? How should trust decide which frontline staff have priority for vaccination? And how will you reassure NHS staff who are concerned that the vaccine may not be safe? And finally, will NHS staff be allowed to opt out of having the vaccination without penalty? Thank you. The first question relates to the conditions, which, as you can imagine, are very strict and rigorous mainly around the quality areas that we've just been exploring that need to be to the very highest standards. The second area will be around the vigilance, the monitoring of all the safety aspects, particularly as Professor Lim has said, because so many people will want to have this vaccine. And the third area, we will have close control over the information that is provided to healthcare professionals and to the public so that in having that very clear and very precise information, everyone can be confident the vaccine is going to reach them in the best possible way. So those are three main areas, but obviously the extent of the controls of the MHRA are very broad in line with international guidance around good laboratory practice, good clinical practice, and good manufacturing practice. We will be watching very closely that all those requirements and conditions are complied with. Public can be confident of that. Perhaps I can turn to Professor Lim for some of the aspects you've raised, and particularly as NHS staff will need to have that confidence too. Thank you. The uh, JCBI has advised that there are certain uh, frontline healthcare and social care workers who should be offered higher priority. And these are based around their own personal risk of coming to 
harm or having severe illness from COVID-19. Secondly, the amount of exposure that they have to people who have COVID-19 infection themselves. And thirdly, the amount of uh, interaction they have with different people who are vulnerable and might acquire COVID-19. So uh, we have set out some principles on how to prioritize different healthcare workers uh, and use those when deployment of the vaccine uh, is, is indicated. Uh, in terms of whether it should be voluntary or compulsory, uh, at the moment, there is no suggestion that the offer of vaccination uh, should be compulsory taken up. It is always an offer of vaccination and whether somebody wants to have a vaccine or not, whether they're in the NHS or not, uh, is at the moment a voluntary thing. But JCVI is not a policy making body. Policy is made by ministers. The clear and helpful information that will be provided will enable the conversations to go on on an individual level so that anyone who has any questions can have them clearly and thoroughly answered. So Munir, yes, please do. I, maybe I can add something about safety. Uh, the trials had about 40,000 individuals uh, and half of those received the vaccine and half received the placebo. Um, from the data that's been provided, um, most of the adverse effects um, were mild uh, and short lasting, usually uh, lasting for a day or two, similar to the kind of uh, 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 um, effects you get after any other vaccine. Um, so that is really important uh, to, to note. We haven't identified any serious adverse reactions uh, throughout the trial program, but it is important to continually monitor the safety of this and the MHRA has a very proactive uh, vigilance strategy to be able to monitor the safety. Uh, pro uh, prominent amongst that is the yellow card system, which anybody can report on, including uh, um, uh, members of the public, but also uh, the active recall system that the MHRA is going to launch, which will um, ask members to be able to join and, and uh, look at what's happening with the vaccine and whether they're developing any kind of um, side effects. It's all well prepared and we're ready to roll into action now. I think that completes all our questions. Thank you to all the journalists who've joined this morning. I'll ask my colleagues if you have any final remarks. Professor Lim? Uh, yes, I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved uh, in helping JCBI come to its advice. I'd like to stress that we have so far advised how the vaccine might be used in the first phase of the program. We haven't yet decided how the vaccine might be used in subsequent phases of the program, and we will be monitoring all the new emerging data, including data coming out from phase one of the program, in order to make our further decisions. Thank you, that's really helpful. So Munir, any concluding remarks? Thank you. Um, I think that uh, um, we are uh, in the midst of a once in a century pandemic. And I think this is a historic moment. The UK is now one step closer to providing a safe and effective vaccine to help in the fight against COVID-19. A virus that has affected each and every one of us uh, in some way, uh, and this will help to save lives. Thank you. I would simply like to conclude by reiterating that this vaccine produced and developed by Pfizer-BioNTech meets rigorous high standards of safety, of effectiveness and of quality. The public's safety has always been at the forefront of our minds. Safety is our watchword and it will always continue to be so. Thank you. We can now conclude this briefing. <laughs>